Hello, welcome to another live event with Vectric here on YouTube. I'm Todd, and um, if you've been here before, welcome back again. If you haven't been by before to see one of these events, let me tell you how it's going to unfold. Um, so today we're going to do the same thing that Rebecca did last week, or Becky did last week with her backpack project, and that is we are going to show a video of a project that I created for the 2019 Vectric user group meetings. We showed it here in the UK and then also in Denver, Colorado. Um, so after this little bit here, I'll be in the chat room to answer any questions that you have about the project. And of course, other Vectric people will be here as well to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so last week, um, Rebecca, like I had said, showed off her wooden backpack. Now, if you haven't seen this wooden backpack in real life, it is a pretty amazing thing. It looks really, really nice, and she did a fantastic job on it. That video is actually uh, on YouTube now, so you can watch it if you haven't. And you can actually download that project for free if you would like to have a stab at cutting it yourself or even making it your own by changing it up a little bit if you'd like to which would be kind of fun. If you do do that, we'd like to see what you do. So make sure you post it over in the Vectric forum so we can have a look at that. So let's get to uh, to this week's project. So again, um, last year um, in Denver, um, we did a presentation on this. Um, and this is it right here in the corner. This, this way, I guess it is right there. Um, so I... In Canada, when I lived there, I had a tiny shop in my uh, basement, and um, I loved it. I went there all the time. Moving to the UK, places are a bit smaller, so I really don't have much of a shop anymore. Hopefully that will get better. But when I was back in Canada, I was like all of you. I had my cell phone. I had my shop. I like listening to music while I was in my shop, put my cell phone down, and it undoubtedly would get stacked underneath um, a pile of wood or books or something or other and I can never find it when I needed it mainly because I was taking pictures of what I was doing and thought I'd like to have it safe at hand and it never was so I thought it'd be kind of nice if I could make first of all a a speaker to replace some of the stuff that I had downstairs already in my basement but also um, a place to put my cell phone when uh, I didn't need it and I could always find it and so that's where this came from this this lovely little speaker here so in a minute, what we're going to do is we are going to take you through the, um, the steps that I went through to go from a prototype, which is that up there in the, the top corner um, of a speaker, which, to be honest, and I do mention this in the video, that I really hoped it wasn't going to be a prototype. I really hoped that it was going to be the final thing. Um, but in the end, it did work out to be a prototype. Um, and for the better, because in the end, I think what I came up with is a much better um piece to look at something i like to have in my own house in the end if i could so um anyway so we're going to start off with the first bit of the video which is going to be um me talking through my prototype now i'm going to be pointing out some of the things that obviously i looked at and when i went to create the final project I either used that as a basis for what I did in the end or some of the learning experiences and I changed up totally or completely to the finished product. So you might as well get comfortable. This is going to be about 60 minutes or so of me talking about this speaker, but I think you're going to take a lot from this in the end, not only from a product design point of view, but also from how to use your software more efficiently with your layers and so on when you're doing your artwork. Okay. Anyway, so let's just go ahead and we're going to start the video. And don't forget, if you have any questions during this, pop them in the chat and um, I'll do my best to answer them with the help of all of us other Vectric employees. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Here we go. My inspiration for this job was that I love to have music in my shop. And if you're anything like me, you've been given a hand-me-down radio or media player that you need to use in your shop to play any sort of music. Well, we all have one of these in our pockets nowadays. Well, maybe not that one, but we have one of these in our pocket. And if I could create something that I could have in my shop that not only helped with the music quality, hopefully, but also was a place that I could store my phone so I wouldn't set it down and lose it in my shop. That was going to be a great thing. So what I did was I came up with a design and I thought I had carefully thought it through. And sometimes you don't know until you actually make the thing. 
And so I found some design information online using Google, of course, Instagram and YouTube, and also some Pinterest. And I did some sketches. Sketches are great. I find it a great way to get ideas out of my head and also discount some ideas that may not work just because they're not practical. Then I took my ideas and went into the software. And I knew that in this case, a lot of my design was going to be based off of actually having a nice front design. So using layers in the software was really going to make it easy for me to create this final design. So this is the files that I created for the first version of the shop speaker. Um, my idea was that I wanted this to be essentially the last version. Um, and also I wanted to cut it out of some material we just had kicking around in the labs so I could make sure that everything was going to cut fine and then I could just cut it into good wood and present it at the user group meeting. So let's have a look at the face. So we have our face layer is selected. Um, some things I want to point out is that the rectangles for the grill are here and I use an offset of the VCARV logo. These two vectors here are the VCARV logo that I created um, using the bitmap trace tool from a logo that I just got off our website. Uh, I traced it, offsetted that out, and then I put these rectangles in so that the corners or some face of it just touched this border. Now this border is here, this offset is here um, for a couple of reasons. One is I visually I wanted a bit of a gap that looked nice. Uh, also I needed some material so that when I pocketed out the back I could make the recess big enough so that um, it would fill in the VCARV logo. So you see between here and this light blue outline, um, that's the actual acrylic that I that I use. Um, there's or the pocket in the back of the acrylic, excuse me. That is, um, it'll fit in there nicely. So that's great. Uh, and it'll cover up all of my logo. So if we take a look at the toolpaths, what we're going to use is the um, preview the toolpaths using our solid view, not the wireframe view. So you can see that my pockets for my grills end up having round ends because the geometry of my tool is round. So I knew that ahead of time, but I didn't bother to draw that in because I knew that that was, that was the case. I have the leg toolpath, which again is just a pocket. So it's going to pocket out this area for the leg, but note that in the corner, there's a part that's going to get missed. And this profile cut will actually go along and it cuts only down to the top of the leg. So it actually cuts off that little bit of material. And also when I go ahead and profile the back to cut this part out, I only cut down as far as I've cut down in the front, that way I'm not going to waste any time and my tabs will survive on the back. With the logo, I needed or I wanted the logo to have nice sharp corners like the real logo has. I didn't want them to be round. So if I used a tool like an end mill with round geometry on the tip or large round geometry on the tip, these would end up getting all rounded out at the corners. So what I decided to do was to use an end mill to pocket out this area here. So if we look at that, we're going to pocket out the logo. And then what I want to do is go back in with a V-carve bit and cut between here, these vectors, and that vector that I used to pocket it out to give me a nice little chamfer. So in the end, this is what I end up cutting. Now, because of the way the geometry is of a V-bit, the top of it was going to be round, but at the back, it was going to be nice and sharp. So I should get that nice sharp blue logo like I wanted. And only cutting down a little bit on the front because I needed to pocket out the back. So if we go ahead and have a peek at the back toolpaths I created, you'll see that I have a, well, there's my pockets for my pegs for the table. And I have my pocket for my logo. So I'm going to cut that out. And then I do a profile cut to cut everything out. So let's flip back to our 3D view to our front. And let's preview all of our tool paths. So we'll just preview all sides and you'll see what happens. So there are my grill, there's my logo, there's my chamfer on there, there's a pocket on the back, and then you saw it do the profile cut. And this is what I end up with. So you'll see I've got my chamfer, I've got nice semi-sharp corners at the base of this, my pocket in the back, I only cut down so there was some material left here on the front. And that all should have worked out perfect. Now let's have a look now at my 
middle. Now the middle, the sound chamber for this, is just a series of pockets. So these are straight sided walls. So I pocketed out between here and there, and from then I pocketed out the center right through my material. So I had, if you will, one two steps because this is the surface of my material to create my sound chamber. It's a single sided part, and that was pretty easy and worked out well. And then my back. So my plan was that I would pocket, this is the back of my chamber, my sound chamber, which again has straight walls. I'm gonna pocket this out, which will end up leaving behind when I pocket out my, fo pocket out my phone um, hole or my cavity for my phone, should leave a nice little shelf here so that in the end my phone will sit inside. The speakers will be able to force the sound down at the back of the chamber and then the actual sound will come out through the front. So that's pretty much the basis of the original version of my shop speaker. Well, in the end, I cut it and I cut really, really well. I was happy with it. I found some plywood and some other wood just kicking around in the shop. There were a few mistakes, but nothing that couldn't be fixed with a couple little changes in the software and then a recut. I glued it all up just to kind of test it out to make sure everything was fine. And then, well, I found out that my phone in the case doesn't quite fit. And well, if I take the case off my phone, it's not really all that stable. And then, well, there was really no way to open it up and take a look inside or even clean it for that matter. And I really had put a lot of thought into the internal design. So I really wanted to be able to show that off if somebody asked. But I know what you're all thinking. How did it sound? Well, it actually sounded really good. I was really quite happy with it. Uh, I'm not sure if it was the plywood or the way that I built my sound chamber or even the way the grill was shaped, maybe all of that together, but it did sound quite nice. So I knew that I was on the right track. So I had to go back and do some redesigning. So I knew I had to make the slot bigger. If I removed the front leg off of the speaker, then it would end up being more stable. And if I could add the ability to open it up, then that would be nice too. And then seeing as I have to go back and do all that work, um, if I could find maybe a way to make it a bit heavier, if I could improve the logo and the grill design, that would be nice too. Um, I wanted to make the sound chamber a little bit nicer and somebody in the office had given me the idea of maybe using a form tool for that. I thought that would be a good idea. And then taking the overall design and just making it a little bit nicer and maybe something that you might use in your house or maybe you give away to a friend instead of just having sitting in the back of a shelf in your shop collecting dust. So I went into the software, I took the original design and I worked straight from that and I started to create my new design. So what I did when I found out that my first version was going to be a, in air quotes, prototype, um, I decided that I needed to go in and make some changes. So to do that, I opened up my old file, renamed it, saved it off, and then used that as the basis to build my new file. So if we go and open an existing file, you'll see that in your folder there are five files uh, named uh, one through five. Um, the first three are files that you're going to use to develop the design or that I use to develop design cut the design and then cut the acrylic for the design. And the last two are there if you decide that you may want to either manually nest these so you can cut more than one, or if you want to use our auto nesting feature uh, with the new double-sided benefit um, to do that, then you can go ahead. So let's have a look at the first file. Now again, this was developed from the original prototype file that I made. And uh, this is the end file that I use to actually develop my cut file from. So we're going to go through this. I'm going to go through each um, different part of the speaker. And then I'm going to highlight different areas that I feel that have some good information that you can take away with you and um, use in your next project or creating your own shop speaker for that matter. So let's have a look at the actual job dimensions. Now, again, this is the same dimensions that I used for the first version. Actually, it's slightly longer because I wanted to make it a little bit longer to make it a little bit more stable. And then also I wanted to make sure that I had a different way to 
hold the three pieces together and that was going to be using uh, a long bolt and a nut. Each part of this particular one is double-sided. Um, double-sided because I decided to do my profile cut on the second side. So the actual middle bit, the sound chamber, didn't need to be double-sided, but it may well have been because I wanted to do all the profile cuts from the same side. Now the rest of this isn't so important unless you really know how you're gonna cut this. I have a standard kind of setup so I know what I'm doing with this sort of thing or I know how I would like it to be set up. So um, I always zero off the top of my material. My datum's always set to the center typically uh, because uh, that's just what I like to do. But also when it comes to actually designing a project, I find it easier to have my a datum in the center of my material. That way everything gets lined up to the center. Um, I always flip bottom to top. I'm not really sure why. I guess it's just a habit. And I don't scale my design with my job size. Um, and I use a standard modeling resolution for this particular job. Because there isn't any 3D content, there's no reason to have uh, a lot of extra pixels that I'm not going to need. So I just use a standard resolution. That would be perfect. And then my Canadian maple is the actual material color. So let's just click OK. Now, when I'm developing a project like this, I really do take advantage of the layers, the layers feature in your software. Uh, there's a lot of vectors going along, along here. There's a lot of stuff I need to keep track of and where they are in the file. And this makes it a little easier too when I go to actually pull this apart and lay it out on my material so I can cut it all in one piece. So you'll see that I have five different layers. I have a reference layer and a face layer. So the reference layer is basically anything that I'm not gonna cut really, that I just need there for reference. Like for instance, if I was gonna use hold downs, I had to avoid, I might draw those. In this case, I, I wanted to make sure that the size of the bolt that I was gonna use to hold all three pieces together wasn't gonna overhang the outside of my actual design. So I drew that in there at the right size. And so that lives on this particular reference layer. So I can hide and show those if I would like, but they're there mainly, again, just for my reference. I always start off with one part and I base everything else on that part. So in this case, I felt the best part to base my whole job on was going to be my face. So as soon as I get my face right, and I think about some of the other parts of the job, then I can just copy elements from that to develop the rest of my parts, which is what I did. Then we have the acrylic, the middle, which is the sound chamber, the main sound chamber, and then the back, which has the back bit of the sound chamber and the part where we actually put our phone in. And then the, um, the sound channel where the sound comes out of my cell phone and then flows down through the actual speaker. So let's go ahead now and take a look at how I actually went and developed some of the elements on the front of the speaker. I'm gonna hide my reference bolt heads because I don't need those right now, but you'll see that I did actually draw some bolt holes here. These bolt holes are slightly bigger than the shaft of my bolt. I wanted a little bit of wiggle room, which sometimes you really don't want, but I want a little bit of wiggle room just because I wanted to be able to line up all of my parts after I sanded them and make sure that it sat flat. And then I have my holes in the front here to expose the grill. That is the acrylic grill that we'll cut later. I'll show you how I did that later. And then also the holes to show the V-Carb logo. Um, and what it does is just, just reveals the blue acrylic um, and it shows through my full cuts through the V-Carve logo. Now let's just go ahead and show you how I developed the offset for the back so that I knew how to pocket out the back because on the back of the face, it has quite a deep pocket so that I can slide in my acrylic and it comes almost to the face of my material. And then also how I use that vector to create these reveals for the acrylic grill. Now part that I didn't show you in the original look at my prototype file was how I came up with the vectors for the V-Carve logo. So let me just show you that now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and hide all of my layers and I'm gonna go over to file and I'm gonna import in a bitmap. And I went to the Vectric site and downloaded a copy of the V-Carve Pro logo and I opened that up. And when I do that, it will automatically set up a bitmap layer for me. It highlighted the reference uh, layer. So let's go back and make sure that we have the bitmap layer ref highlighted because we want all the work that we do to go onto that layer for right now. And let's just close that down. So 
But having this logo, I didn't need all of the logo. I only really want to trace this end of it. So if I grab this logo and I size it up so that the actual V-Card logo is approximately the size of the, the finished thing, just approximately, because I can size it afterwards. Then I'm going to go to my drawing tab and use a feature of our software called Trace Bitmap. But before I do that, I actually want to crop out only the bit that I want it to trace. I don't want to trace all this stuff along with I don't want to deal with any kind of maybe noise that will happen or any extra vectors I may forget to delete. So to do that, I'm going to create a vector outline just of the piece I want to keep, just roughly. It doesn't have to be exactly right. There we are. And press Escape to leave that. I'm going to select that vector and then Shift and select my bitmap. And then I'm going to use this new feature called Crop Bitmap. So I'm going to click that. And now I have my bitmap cropped. And now I'm only going to keep that. So I'm going to delete this vector. So I'm going to use a feature called Trace Bitmap. It's set to black and white. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and preview the defaults that happen to be here right now. And that seems to do a pretty nice job of what I want. But if I needed to have uh, better fits on my corners or if I need to get rid of some new noise I could go ahead and use these sliders to get rid of that we'll just click apply because I'm happy with that and we'll close that down and then we'll delete the bitmap and there we have it so I can take this set of vectors now and I could use those as the basis for my v-carve logo I could size them up and down and place them where I wanted to on my face so I'm not going to need those right now because I already have them drawn so let's turn off my bitmap layer and go to my face layer and select that and make sure that that is the one that's selected. Now let's go ahead and take a minute and look at how I developed the reveals for the grill and um, why I decided to go with the rounded corners. Um, so first of all, the rounded corners came for a couple of reasons. One is that I like the idea as a design element because the outside of my profile of my speaker has these radius corners and so I didn't want too many sharp corners in my design with the exception of of course the VCARV logo I couldn't do anything about that but also these serve an important function when it comes to visualizing and also cutting my part um, I knew that I was going to use a quarter inch end mill to do a lot of this work with so these are actually all been radius, so a quarter inch end mill will fit in there perfectly. And we can illustrate that by drawing a circle. Uh, my center points are zero, zero, so it's gonna draw it right in the center of my job. And it's a has a diameter of a quarter inch. So we're gonna go ahead and create that and click close. And if I select that circle and move it around, you'll see that it fits everywhere that it needs to fit so that it looks so what I see here and what I've drawn will look exactly like what it should when I go to cut it. Now, I also know, because I'm familiar with the tools that we have in our shop, that our end mills are slightly smaller than that, the majority of them. So this will actually be a true fit for what I have. So that's great. So let's just go ahead and delete that. So now how did I go ahead and develop these? Well, to illustrate that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this outside vector, hold down my shift key, select my bolt holes, and also select my um, my logo and I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to go ahead and copy to a layer and I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to call this scratch I'm going to use this scratch layer a lot during this this demo and we're going to make it green and we'll click OK and that's perfect let's go up to our layer manager and we're going to turn off our face layer and make sure that we have our scratch layer selected and that's great so to develop the front, there's a couple things I need to remember was that I want my acrylic to pocket in through the back and it needs to fit in specifically. And that's going to be important because I can't, I want to be able to make sure that my acrylic fits in there and my face doesn't reveal any, uh, anything I don't want it to. Um, and second of all, uh, it's an important part of me developing how the front is going to look. So let's do that first. Let's draw this vector that I'm going to use to um, pocket out the back of the front of my speaker. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select these, um, sorry, select the outside vector. And I knew that my wall thickness um, could be about around 0.125 inches thick, which um, I, th I thought would be thick enough. And I was right. This is one of those things when if you don't know your material very well, you might need to cut a couple sample pieces to make sure that you understand how thin you can make that before it's um, not going to be not going to hold up or it's going to break but also I wanted to be thick enough that it would 
it wouldn't vibrate too much uh, and it wouldn't affect the sound of my speaker. So let's take that, we're gonna offset that inwards and we're gonna make that 0.125. We don't need to worry about selecting new and we'll offset that in and that's great. The next thing we're gonna need is Right now, if I use that vector to pocket at the back of my, my face of my speaker, then uh, my bolts would go through the front and be held in place by whatever material I have left behind on my face. And that would be it until it gets to the next section of my speaker, the um, sound chamber. But I wanted it to be nice and solid. So what I need to do is I need to offset these guys out, the bolt holes, and we'll close that down. Now I'm gonna use these vectors to modify this pocket in the back. So if we select this pocket vector and hold my shift key and select one of these offsetted uh, bolt holes, I'm going to go ahead and use our subtract, um, edit, ob edit object subtract. And what that will do is it'll actually subtract that circle away from that outside border. So again, outside border, hold down your shift key, select that, subtract that. And we're going to do that for all of them. Wrong order. There we have it, and that's great. Now, when we talked about me making sure that my tool would fit everywhere it could fit, it definitely will not fit in these sharp little pointy areas. It'll get to right about here, but it's not gonna get in there. But again, I wanna make sure that I know what this thing is gonna look like when it's done, and also be able to troubleshoot any problem areas that I might have. And visually, if I was gonna show this to a customer, just showing them vectors, then uh, this next step is pretty handy to know. I'm gonna use our filleting tool, and I'm gonna fillet all of these sharp points, the radius of my tool, or half the diameter of my tool. So that is gonna be 0.125, because I'm using a quarter inch tool. So we're gonna go ahead and click there, and there, and you'll see that when I hover over a spot that it can fill it this little check mark will appear below the fillet profile. And I can just go around now and fill it all of these one at a time until I get them all. And now I can be sure that my tool will actually get in there and cut those. So that looks great. So now the next thing I want to do is I'm going to go in and offset my logo out. Now there's a couple things I knew I had to keep in mind when I did this is that when I create my grill, I'm gonna use the same fillet idea. So the ends of my negative spaces in my grill are gonna be round. And so I wanna make sure that they have enough room to tuck in behind the wood on the face so I don't see those round bits, I don't wanna see them. So to do that, I did a little bit of testing and I found out that if I use 0.3 of an offset, then that covers up a lot of that. So we're gonna go ahead and offset those outwards 0.3. And there we have that. Now the next part of my design is that I need to actually come up with the vectors for these reveals for the grill. So there's one right here and then one over here. To do that, I wanna make sure that the, the design is well balanced. So this space here needs to be equal to what I have out here to the top of my grill. So this is 0.3, this was offset in 0.125. So the difference, if I offset this out, the difference of those two, then this should be well balanced on the front, along with it should take into consideration those circle ends that I have of my negative space in my grill. So let's take this, we're gonna offset that inwards, 1.23 minus 0.125, and if you didn't know already in any of the fields in our software that accept numbers, you can do math in there. So you just put in the mathematical formula that you want and then press equals on your keyboard and you'll get the, the answer. And that's inwards, offset that. So now the distance from here to there is equal-ish to the distance between here and there. Fair enough, let's close that down. And before we go any further, I don't need this vector anymore. So I'm gonna right click on that and I'm gonna say move to the other side of the scratch layer. And I can use that now to pocket out the back side. And then we're gonna take this vector and hold down my shift key and this vector, and we're gonna use that subtract feature again. And that will give me the outside edges of my speaker reveals or my grill reveals. Select that, again, we're gonna do the old fillet thing again, 0.125. Now, what you're gonna find is that sometimes you need to zoom in to get this to work 
exactly right because sometimes there could be some extra nodes there that it's going to select so for instance that one there we might need to zoom in a little bit to get the right node same with that one this guy that one this one so all of these sharp points we want to be filleting to make sure that we this one might be a bit of a bear to get a hold of so yeah let's just go ahead and go in and we'll Take a look at that. There might be an extra node there or two that we need to move around. This last one, and then we will get there. Let's go find that guy I couldn't. So let's close this down. We'll select that vector. We'll hit in on our keyboard for node mode. Oh yeah, see there's all kinds of nodes there. So now if I'm actually zoomed in and I use the fillet, I bet you now that's gonna work. There we are, perfect. I just couldn't get the right node to close. Okay, that's great. So there you have, we have our reveals for our actual grill, which I think was quite nice. It's all balanced off quite well, I think it looks good. And there you have it. That's how I developed those, the design for the front of the shop speaker. So for now, we're gonna go ahead and Look at our layers manager or we'll right click on the scratch layer and we're going to delete that. We're not going to keep any of those vectors. Okay, and then we're going to go back to our face again and have a look at this again. Okay, so the every layer that you have has a front and a back. So that's kind of handy when you're actually laying something out like this. So if I look at the back side of this, you'll see I only have one vector and this is the vector I'm going to use to actually pocket out the back. So that's there, and that looks great. I'm happy with all of that for right now. Now let's have a look at the acrylic grill that I made for the inside of the face. So if we go ahead and look at our layers manager again and display or turn on our acrylic, our acrylic layer, you'll see that this is the actual acrylic layer that I have. And the these spaces here our actual negative space so these are actually cut all the way through so you can see if you look through this you can see the sound chamber of my speaker and then also there's enough material on the outside edges so that i have it'll hold together okay and then there is enough material here so that you won't see where my tool starts to round out so all of these are going to be nice and flat areas so to develop that, there was some offsetting that happened. There was some filleting, of course, and some thought that went into that. So let me show you quickly how I went and did all of that. So if we go to our Layers Manager again and we hide our face, and we're just going to look at our acrylic. So this outside border, that actually came from the vector that I used for the inside of the back. I just copied it to this um, layer and then offset it in 0 0.01 of an inch so it's just a hair smaller but that made it so i could fit it in and out easily into the back and i was worried about if there was any variation in my wood or the wood anything happened to the wood then it actually still fit in there quite easily um, and then i have the logo here just so that we can um, visualize where the reveal is for the logo on the front so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this outside vector hold down my shift key and select again the logo right click and we're going to copy those to a uh, a layer it's going to be a new layer and again we're going to call this scratch i've deleted the other one so this is a a new one and we'll click ok and then we can hide the acrylic layer and then we'll just work on our scratch layer. So again, this is the an offset of the vector that I used for the inside of the back. So we're gonna take this again and we're gonna offset it again just slightly um, so that we have some um, material to hold uh, our whole part together. So let's offset that in uh, 0.125 inwards offset. Now I was a little bit unsure of whether or not this is going to be enough material or not to hold the acrylic. I, I'm not, I don't cut acrylic very often, but I thought I'd give it a shot and see what happens. So let's close that down. And then we're also going to take our logo here and we're going to offset this outwards um, less than what we did on the front, because of course we want to make sure that we can hide all of the ends of the acrylic, the, the round bits inside of that. So we're going to go ahead and offset that out point two five of an inch 
Uh, that's a little bit too much. So let's just go ahead and delete that. And let's do that again. Let's just go with the 1.25. We'll see what happens. Okay, outwards offset. That's great. That looks pretty good. So we got this amount of space here that we can kind of to, uh, fool around with to make sure everything works out okay. I think that looks okay. So let's close that down. And then we need to draw a line from here to here. And this is to position the grill that we're going to be using, okay? We need that line to copy our grill rectangles along. And then we need to create a rectangle that's oversized. It has to be larger than the back of our part. But the height needs to be a minimum of a quarter inch. That's important because that's the size of our cutter. And we're going to click Apply. We'll close that down. We're going to use our copy along a vector option. So we're going to click that. So we need to select an object and then a, um, a line to copy along. So there's our object and we've got our line. And we are going to make sure there's a minimum distance between each copy of a quarter inch. There has to be. Now I don't know, I, I could have just laid this out by hand, but I thought this would be an easier way of doing it and a smarter way of doing it. So it's just going to automatically copy that along the line and just come up with the amount that it feels fits along that line. So we're going to go ahead and copy that. That's perfect. Close that down. Now in the end, I knew I only wanted to have um, th four negative space holes and three grills. So that means I only needed 10. So three grills, four, I mean, sorry, seven, three and four, seven. So I don't need all of these. So we can delete the original one. I don't need that anymore. Um, we need that one. We always need one. Hold down my shift key, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these bottom three I don't need. So we can just start deleting those off of there. That's great. Now let's go ahead and select these top ones we have. And then I'm going to stretch those the full length of my line. Now, so obviously they started off at a quarter inch tall, and now they're actually even taller, so that's perfect. Oh, I need to shrink this down from the top a little. Just to go to there. Perfect. Okay. So if we want to see how thick these are, we can just select one of them and press T on the keyboard, and you'll see that they're approximately 0.32 of an inch tall. So that's wonderful. It's perfect. So now what we want to do is delete all the ones out that we want to stay as the blue grill. So this second one we're going to delete, this one we're going to delete, this one we're going to delete. And so we have negative space, negative space, negative space, negative space. That's perfect. So now we're going to take this line here. Oh, first of all, we need to group these guys up because we want to do this all in one operation. So let's group you, right click, and we're going to go down and we're going to group those together. And then we're going to take that is already selected. Hold down my shift key, select this line here, and we're going to do the old subtract thing again. And there we have it. So that's perfect. So now we know that I have enough blue here to, so that I won't see through on the back side. So I won't see through. Um, I won't see through into my sound chamber. And if I delete these guys that here, I don't need them anymore, then this is all going to be blue and it's going to look great. Now we have a bit of a problem because I have these rectangles sort of hanging off the edge of my, um, outside the edge of this vector. So now we need to go ahead and crop the ends off of these. So to do that, I am just going to simply do the old, press the N on the keyboard node mode, use my cursor keys and drag those in so that they're always on the inside of this outside line. They have to be because I need to make sure that I keep the this space there. Perfect. So it's great. Same here. Probably quicker ways of doing this, but this when I was working through this whole process, I was trying to just work with it and figure out how I could make it all work out. So that's great. I want to just fix these guys here just a little bit, bring them inside that line. I want to make sure there's at least a minimum of that. It's perfect. Now I can go ahead and delete out this outside line. I don't need that anymore. But now I'm going to use the same fillet operation that I used before to go ahead and fillet these to be the right length. And we'll fillet those all. And this might be one of those situations where I'm going to need to zoom in. And 
do some, uh, let me fix that one. Zoom in and fix all the ones that aren't going to allow me because there could be some nodes, like I had said before, in a bad spot that are just, and me being this far zoomed out might just be causing a bit of a problem. So I'll just go ahead and get the ones I can. Now again, these round ends, I really wanted to make sure were going to be hidden behind the wood of the face. That's really important for my design because it was, I don't want to see those round ends. So there we have it. So that's our grill. Now that's fine and all, but how are we going to go ahead and I would leave that line out of there. How are we going to go ahead and make sure that this works? Okay. Well, again, we can just go back and look at our face and you'll see that what happens is all of these round areas and any that don't, what I had to do was there was a couple of them that I just, it just didn't quite work out well. So as long as I didn't encroach inside of the space, I can go ahead into node mode and just kind of slide these nodes along until this node is inside of that line. And so it's actually going to be covered up and I didn't actually, you won't, it won't cut out enough so that I'll be able to see through my logo. And there was one other one that I saw that needed to be looked at. Over here, just kind of creep you over there. So in this one here, I'm a little worried I might get a little thin there. So to do this one, what I might end up doing is just putting him back where he was. And then we're just going to take this one there out on its own. And that should still be okay. If anything, it's going to leave a little extra material there, which is fine. So there you go. So now you can see how that grill worked out. That worked out pretty good. Um, everything without too much of a hassle. And um, I think everything um, is going to look fine. That was a bit of an organic thing. Sometimes when you're designing this stuff, you just kind of go with the flow. And as long as you have a good idea of what the end result is, then you're going to be okay with that. So let's select that. Again, we don't need this. We're going to delete that scratch layer. And we're going to leave all the data on that. And then we can go back and just look at our acrylic again. And this is the actual one that I ended up with. Let's have a look at the middle section of the speaker. So this is the sound chamber. So if we go up to our layer, our level manager again, and we click on uh, middle, and we unclick these uh, the face in the acrylic, and make sure we have middle highlighted, you'll see that we have the actual um, level that I used for the sound chamber. So you'll see that we have the outside vector. This was copied from the um, the face layer and then we have the four bolt holes again we're copied from the face layer so that they're consistent all the way through the project and then i have this thing in the middle i i, I like the idea of my original prototype with the actual hard stepping down of the ridges on the inside of the sound chamber but i thought that it would look a little bit nicer if we could do something a bit different so this is an actual vector that I created of a form tool that I got from our support manager, Mark. And uh, he had already taken a standard router bit, taken the bearing off the end and ground down um, the post that was left so that we had a uh, router bit that we could use in the end of our CNC. And this is the actual profile that I drew for that. And, and I needed this particularly because um, I wanted to make sure that my offsets were enough to accommodate this tool. Uh, so I drew this just based off measurements off of the actual tool. A lot of these form tools, you could actually go on to the manufacturer's site and download a profile. But in this case, I actually had to draw it by hand, which was just very basic measurements off the side of the tool. Um, this is a, a one inch round uh, tool, and this was a, a quarter inch arc here. So from here to the outside edge is a half inch. So it was really quite easy to draw. And I used this so that I could go ahead and take it and just roll it over my image so that I could make sure that everything was where it should be and having these offsets correctly and also knowing what I was going to do. So this surface here between these two lines here, these two vectors here is actually going to be the top of my material. It's going to get rounded over between these two vectors. And then the next step is going to be rounded again between these two vectors. And this will actually be cut out straight to the bottom. Now, this will make more sense when I actually get around to showing you the tooling step. 
but this is just some very basic offsets. I used the filleting tool again to make sure that these radiuses would, would account for my tool. And I also knew that there is no cutting edge on the bottom of this, so I had to think of a method to get rid of all of the material from the center that I didn't need to cut with the sharp edge of the tool, which was just in here and a little bit of the edge. And again, that will come with our, when I show you how I did the tooling. And then for the last level, and again, let's just for, for show both the face and the middle. So you can see that everything lines up quite nicely. So when you look through the face, we're going to see these round bumps, which is going to look quite nice in the end. And the last part we're going to look at is going to be our back, which again is the same copy from the face profile, the outside edge and the bolt holes. And then there is another ridge here that we use that same form tool right here between these two lines. Here, it's going to be rounded over the last bump and then this will end up being the back of our sound chamber. This vector here, we use to pocket out an area for um, the sound to come down from the bottom of my phone into the sound chamber. And then we have the section that I used for the, uh, the recess where you can, or the slot that you can slide your phone into. This was based on the dimensions of um, my phone and larger so that it would accommodate a bigger phone and then a little bit deeper and I did that in the tooling stage so that I could actually put my phone in there with the case. Now you will notice and I'll point this out probably again when we talk about the tooling is the shelf that's left is only this little area right here and in my case my phone didn't quite sit in there flat unless I put it right directly in the middle of the slot. If I was a little bit off it would kind of fall off on a bit of a the rounded corner of my case would kind of sit funny. So I ended up adjusting this in the final file that you're going to get to cut with. So it's actually a little bit longer, but you're going to want to adjust this based on your phone yourself, or maybe the phones that you're going to be making this for if you intend on making it. Now let's have a look at the back side of this particular level. You'll see that I have these two, these four little areas here. And when my bolt is in all the way, it just barely reaches the other side, the back side of my material. So once I have all three pieces put together, there weren't enough threads on the end of the bolt to put on the nut, um, which I really didn't want it, the nut hanging out the back of it anyway. So these are actually going to be used to pocket a little spot for the nut to go into. So if we go back and we show the reference again, you'll see that the, the nut actually will fit inside of that little circle there. So I just offset the bolt hole out a bit and then drew this shape. Um, and then just kind of added a big lump to it here so that my tool will fit in there and will actually come in quite nicely and cut into my material nice and end up really like quite nice on the other side. So it gave these nice little pockets and you can see, we'll show that again in the actual tooling step. So there we have, there's all three of our layers to make up our speaker and it looks a bit messy when you have them all together but you can see that everything lines up the outside vectors line up the bolt holes line up um, the the ridges for the sound chamber all line up quite nicely um, and in hindsight i might have actually did a little bit better job with my radiuses here um, but i'm pretty happy with them in the end and they did cut quite well now after i had the design all sorted out in the software I had to go and create the cutting file. Well, in order to do that, I needed to find some new material. So I took a look around the labs at Vectric and found some material that may or may not have worked, but then I ran into some really nice material that I thought would do the job. There's enough of it, and I could actually cut maybe even more than one of these. I gathered up the cutters that I thought I needed. I needed a quarter inch end mill, so I found a quarter inch end mill that was point two four five inches the diameter was which was great i borrowed mark's mystery tool from his desk drawer which was a modified router bit and uh, decided i would use that for my form tool and then also um, i had a 60 degree v bit that i'd used before and it always worked really well so i thought i would use it and then i needed to go back into my software and take that original design and then break it up and turn it into the final layout so I could start to create some tooling. 
Okay, so now that we have our design all made up and we're pretty confident everything lines up properly, then we can go ahead and create our cut file. So to do that, what I did was I went down and I found a piece of material that I had in the shop um, that would accommodate these this parts that I had, um, or at least hopefully would. Um, took some measurements off of that and then went ahead and adjusted my job settings in this file after I'd saved it off under a new name, so that way I wouldn't be adjusting my my original design file. This would be a new file. And then I worked from that. So let's have a look at that one. So we'll close this down, and then we'll go ahead and open an existing file. And file number two is that file. And right off the bat, let's have a look at my new job settings. So it's still a double-sided job, obviously. We have a, a new width of nine inches because I needed to accommodate my dowel holes for my flipping. If you're not familiar with how to use dowels to do a two-sided to, to do a two-sided job, then there are lots of videos on uh, in the support site that'll help you with that. But essentially, it's a set of asymmetrical holes that you machine through the top of your material, machine the flip of those right into your spoil board, use those to hold your post so that when you turn your job over the post will line up with the front of your job and it just kind of fits on and then you can go ahead and machine your back. So it's a great way of aligning things, works really, really well. The height of this is actually um, the height of my material and I knew that um, there was enough room in this piece of material that I had to accommodate all three parts and a little, little extra to spare, just a very little bit extra to spare. And the thickness is 0.78. Again, we're gonna zero off my material surface center of my job is going to be my datum. I'm going to flip bottom to the top. I haven't changed my modeling resolution and that's great. So we're just going to click OK typically, but I'm going to click cancel here because everything is set up the way I want it to. So we'll have a look. Now we have a new level and it's called dowel holes. So I added a new level and I added some circles in on the front of this um, job. And then I also copied them to the back of my job. So that way they had the reverse on the back side. And that worked out really, really well. Um, and then what I did is I started to move my parts where they had it had to be. So like I had mentioned to you before, your layers have fronts and backs in them. So if I look at my face one alone, you'll see that I have a front. And if I flip it over, you'll see that I have my back. So in this case, I just grab my front set of vectors, I moved them up my job, made sure I, when I did the same thing to the other side. In this case, I copied this outside vector to the other side, so I had some way to align them up and I could keep everything nice and straight, and that's perfect. So if we look at the back of all of these, you'll see that they all have the outside vector here that I could use to align my fronts and my backs again once I brought them, uh, once I moved them around and, and sorted them in the right areas on my material. So let's turn that around. Put my, turn my dowel holes back on again. And let's have a look at the tooling that I created for this. Now I've already gone ahead and grouped these all together into the groups that, um, based on the tools. I didn't want to do a lot of tool changes and I only really wanted to run one tool path and it actually go ahead and work its way through all these tool paths. Don't have a tool changer, so I had to go ahead and change the bit on my own in between each each thing. So that was no problem at all. So let's start off by taking a look at the tooling. Now, when we get to the part down here with the form tool, I'll show you how to actually add the form tool to your tool database, and that'll help you uh, add any tool that you have in your shop uh, manually to your tool database. So let's just um, tile these left and right, and then we're gonna have a look at these one group at a time. So all of these, Actually, let's just not do one group at a time. Let's turn all these off and we'll do them one tool path at a time. So this is the front. Now, what I did when I created the front of this is I used um, a V-carve strategy. So this is the actual um, reveals and the logo. I used our V-carve strategy. I used a V-carve tool and I also used a clearance tool. So what that would do is it goes in with my bigger bit and cuts out all of the material leaves behind an allowance so that I can go in and use my V-carve tool and only cut the parts that need to be touched with the V-carve tool. So let's go ahead and close that and let's preview this particular tool path right here. And you'll see that I just have a pocket. Now if I go down 
and I look at under my vCarve toolpaths, if I only take a look at this one right here, you'll see that this is the vCarve toolpath that it, that it created for me when I used that um, feature of the vCarve toolpath. And it'll create both those toolpaths for you. So it creates one that's called vbit something clear and then the other one is just the vbit toolpath okay and you can break those up once they're created you can break them up but you can also access those settings just by double clicking on either one of them and that's what i did in my particular job here is i have the clear is up top and the 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 actual vcar bit is down here so i could do all of my in mill stuff first and then I can go back and do this. But for now, let's take a look and let's just preview that visible toolpath here and you'll see what happens is I get that chamfer on there. This is the part you can see the little bit of material left behind just the way the V-bit worked, but that's okay because from the back side, I'm actually going to come in and remove that anyway, so it's not important. And uh, there we have the end result that that's going to look like. So let's just go ahead and reset my preview and let's look back at this again. Let's turn off those guys and let's preview that. See that pocket? Now I'm actually going to pocket out this area here. Now when I use the form tool, because there isn't any cutting surface on the bottom, I needed to actually remove the material that would get in the way of the end of my tool. And so to do that, I had to remove this shelf because when this V-bit sits on here and cuts along there, I needed to make sure that this material was removed. And then also when it did the next one here, I needed to make sure that the center was removed as well. So you can see this center had to be removed out of there. And that was important because when the, the machine, the CNC machine moves this over and it plunges down, there's nothing at the bottom of this to remove any material. So I had to make sure that material was missing. And you'll see that the first step is right here. So let's preview that. You'll see that it actually removed that. And if I take a look at the solid preview of that particular toolpath, you'll see that it's actually removing that there. Let's preview the next one, which is because I wanted to add these out. So this is the same depth, so or slightly deeper. This is the pocket for my um, my sound chamber and my phone. So I can go ahead and preview that. That cuts that out. The next one is going to be the center of this. We're going to preview that visible toolpath. So it's going to center out that. And there's some extra material here. You can see it, some little finger pieces sticking up. That's okay, because when I go back with my form tool, I'm actually going to remove that off there. So I didn't mind that being there. Bolt holes. Let's preview those. So we have my bolt holes. That's perfect. And then my pockets for my dowel holes. We'll preview that. And there they are right there. The next bit is going to be, so I swap it out, I put my V-bit in, and we'll have a look at the actual, again, the chamfer here, and you can see in my 2D view the actual solid preview of that. So if I preview that visible toolpath, which was already done, there you are. And then I actually added a chamfer to the outside of the face of my speaker. So that's what this one is for. Let's preview that visible toolpath, and there we have that. And now let's have a look at the form tools themselves. So let's turn on those, and let's have a look at the first one. So this is my first form tool toolpath right here. Okay. Now, how did I get that form tool into my actual tool database? So let's show you how to do that. So let's turn off that toolpath. Let's maximize our 2D view. Let's select this vector, and we're going to press F9 on the keyboard and center it. So like I had mentioned uh, when we were looking at the file that I used to actually develop my design with, I drew this uh, based off measurements off of the tool that I had. And this is the actual whole tool. But when I add it to my tool database, I don't need the whole tool. I just need actually part of it. So if I go ahead and cut this in the center, so I just hover, I'm in node mode. If I hover over top of that node and I press C in my keyboard, it will cut that for me. And then with that selected, if I go to my tool database, you'll see that that tool is still selected, that path profile. And I go and I add a new tool. And then when I'm in my tool type, if I choose form tool, it will pick up this profile that I have 
and it will create the form tool for, for me. And then all I need to do is just create some settings for it. And in this case, I did change the settings slightly. I made sure that my pass depth was equal to the cutting surface, which is right here, which is a quarter inch. I step over, I had set in my final one to be 10%. I slowed down my spindle just a little bit to 12,000 RPMs, inches per minute. And then I decided that I would actually change my feed rate to 100 a little faster and then 30 here and the tool number I don't have a tool changer so it doesn't matter and as soon as I clicked apply and okay it would add it to my tool database for me I'm not going to do that because it's already there it's already called blue form tool right here so if I cancel that and say discard then there we go so that's how you get that form tool in there so if we go back and take a look tile our view again and by the way, there's a great video about how to add tools like that to your tool database in the support site at Vectric.com. So have a look if you need some more information on that. So we'll turn this on and we'll take a look at the first one. Now, the great thing again about this is that now that it knows the profile of my tool, then um, it will actually show that in my preview. So when I preview this visible tool path, you'll see that in my 3D view, you have that nice chamfered look. Now, also, I wanted to point out, I had mentioned before that I might have done a better job when I was creating those um, uh, offsets for my, my form tool. Well, the next tool path right here, I could have actually made this radius a bit better. So when we preview this, You'll see that it fits in there, but it's got this little weird shelf there. But, but that's okay. In the end, once it was all cut, it looked perfect. So those are all the tool paths for the front, and they cut rather quickly. There was nothing too fancy here, um, besides the me actually changing the tools to take any extra time at all. So let's have a look at the back of our job now. Now again, being a two-sided job, I can see from the back side what has happened from the front side. So I have these dowel holes and so on through. Okay, I have my first set of tool, my first tool path is the actual dowel holes that I'm gonna machine into my waste board. So I take my board off my machine and then I machine these right into my, my waste board on my CNC and then I put in my dowels and then I push my board back onto those dowels again. And this toolpath was created by copying these dowel holes from my front to my back, so that way they line up perfectly. Let's have a look at the pocket. So these are the pockets on the back. Now the first pocket we're gonna look at is this big one up top. And this is the one that took the longest to cut. And if we have a take a, take a look at that actual toolpath, you'll see in here that my cut depth is gonna be, um, the wrong toolpath, sorry about that. Take a look at this one here. My cut depth is actually gonna be 0.675, so that leaves me just a little bit of space or, or, or a thickness on the front of um, the difference between that and the 0.79, so about 0.125 on the front um, to give me the thickness of my face. So that's fine, that looks good there. So let's just go ahead and preview that. And for your notation, that was the longest toolpath it takes to cut. So that's just important to know. And you'll see that when now when I cut it, I double clicked it and there's, there's no material to delete, sorry. Um, you'll see that there is enough of a gap here, there's a thickness there to the bottom of that chamfer. Um, and actually it's a little bit deeper than that. So I ended up getting rid of that, a lot of that extra stuff that was left over from the V carving on the front. So just go ahead and look back on that again, down straight on that again. And then we're gonna do our nut recesses. Let's preview that. Looks pretty good. And then the profile cutouts. Let's preview those. Now a few things I wanna point out about this profile pass is that it ended up that, as you can see, this just barely fit into my material. I was worried that my material might flex once I got down to the base of these uh, profile cuts. Um, and also I needed to have some tabs in between. I could have used 3D tabs, but I didn't want to create any 3D tool paths. 
So what I decided to do was just when I created this actual cutout profile and I was setting up my tabs, I lined these inside tabs up with each other or pretty close to each other. So when they were cut, they actually formed a 3D tab there holding these parts together. And that worked really well. I didn't worry about putting any tabs on the outside. Didn't matter. Um, they, would, they would end up being not holding on to any material at all or any material of any consequence. So that worked out okay. And another thing I had to consider too is I had to thicken up my tabs a bit because when I cut my chamfer in on the outside of my face, you'll see that it actually thins my tab on me. So I wanted to thicken those tabs up a bit so that they ended up being um, 0.375 thick, which, which is about as thick as I'd ever want to make a tab that makes it a little more challenging to cut them. So anyway, so that's that. So let's close that down and let's have a final look at the full 3D preview of this. And that actually worked out really well. In the end, like I had said, the I had to expand my shelf out a bit for my own particular phone. So you're going to want to make sure you check that out to make sure that's going to fit properly. Make sure the depth is fine for your case. There's a couple of cases around the office that didn't quite fit in. And um, so you could probably deepen that a little bit if you wanted to. Okay, now, now that we've got the actual tool paths made up for the body of our speaker, let's have a look at the acrylic file that I made to cut out the grill. So let's open an existing file and we're going to look at uh, file number three, shop phone speaker acrylic, and we'll open that up. Now the first thing you're going to notice is that I have some text on here. And this was here so that I remembered what I had done. And um, the way the acrylic was sent to us, the way that we bought it, and I'm assuming this is the way all acrylic comes, is that one side of it has a plastic layer on it so that you won't scratch it. And so when you're working with it, the front of it will always be scratch free. And so what I did was I actually put that face down so that protective coating down on the CNC machine and cut it from the back. And when I did that, I had to be sure that I flipped my grill left to right. So I was cutting from the back side. And then when I took it off and peeled off the, the plastic coating, then the front of it was nice and clean and would look really good in my speaker. So that's why I have flipped left to right on here, just so I remembered what I had done. Now I tried a couple different methods to do this. I had used, um, in order to get the acrylic stuck to the, the wasteboard of the CNC machine, um, I tried double-sided tape. That didn't work out very well because what happened was when I cut through the acrylic, I actually cut into the double-sided tape and it just ended up bunging up the end of my cutter. And then also it ended up um, leaving a lot of residue inside of these grill holes which is really hard to remove so in the end what I did was I put double-sided tape just outside of my actual area that I was going to cut and that was enough to hold it down so when I did cut through it I didn't have that stickiness now also I did use a special cutter for acrylic um, and we'll go over that in a minute just so that you know um, what I had used so that's that's pretty much it. There wasn't anything else I had done to this. In our tool paths, we have the pocket. So this is the grill for the pocket. So it's going to pocket out these holes here. And then I have a profile cut. Um, so in my actual pocket tool path, you'll see that I have a special end mill that I had found kicking around the shop and um, put in its details. And also what I decided to do was to actually slow down the spindle a bit and slow down my feed rate a bit. Now, some people may say that I could have sped up my feed rate. And so that might be something you want to try, but I didn't want to mess around too much. I wanted to try this or try and get it the first time, which actually it took me five times to get it because of my double-sided tape problem and um, some other little issues that came up that I wasn't expecting or that I had to troubleshoot. Um, and hopefully you won't have that problem by not using a double-sided tape inside your cut area. That's the biggest top tip ever. So these are the settings that I used and it worked out perfectly fine. The chipping was great, it didn't melt. There was some strings on the end of my cutter but they peeled off really quite easily carefully i took them off not to cut my fingers so these settings seem to work great for this particular cutter 
And that was great. So let's just go ahead and close this and let's preview that tool path. And that's pretty much it. And thanks to the filleting I did, I got I, it cut exactly as I expected. Nothing was wrong. And then my profile cut. Now, the reason why I had thought I needed a double-sided tape was because I was concerned that um, it would be too hard for me to remove tabs. Um, and I really resisted using tabs on the acrylic. In the end, they were the best thing since sliced bread to use. They certainly did do the job. We used a very thin um, tab to hold it in place, and that's all I needed. And then when I went in, I just used our belt sander and sanded those down. And actually, they were really quite helpful in the end because I left a slight nub there. And so when I put it in the back of my speaker, it actually fit in quite nicely and when it didn't fit I could just sand a little bit more off of that nub and so on and so on until it fit in there quite snug so that actually in the end worked out to be a bonus for me so if we close that down and preview that visible tool path you'll see that we have those small tabs and that worked out really well and really really was super handy so once I ran the profile cuts and cut out the back or cut out the wooden bits of my speaker sanded those down very minimal sanding, mainly just to get rid of the tabs. That was the biggest part. Uh, they looked really, really nice. The grill looked nice. And when it fit all together, I used a beeswax finish, which I think was perfect. The speaker looks really, really nice. And I would be happy to have this in my house, um, along with in my shop, or even give it away as a gift to friends. And it sounds just as good as the original one does, if not a little bit better. Now, a little something extra. In the video on the USB um, that you get at the user group meeting or through your portal account, um, when that is up there for you, you can look at the four extra files that I've included. One is the double-sided nesting. So you can use the new double-sided nesting feature to make more of one of these out of a piece of material. Um, the first video will show you how to recreate the tooling manually, which is great for small batches. And then also I've included the double sided nesting and then using a toolpath template. So if you were going to do a larger volume of these, or if you were going to make um, a slight change to the front of it for different, maybe for different uses, maybe put the different logos on it or with different designs on the sound chamber, then you could go ahead and use this method to easily recalculate your tool paths as long as you set it up properly. Have a look at those. If you need more information, there's some great videos um, on the support site. Okay, let's just go ahead and, and take a minute and talk about what if you want to make more of one of these uh, at one time. Now that you've got your file set up to cut one and you've cut one successfully and you have more of that material kicking around, then what if you want to actually go ahead and make maybe three or four of these as a gift for somebody? Well, that's what the other files that I have set up for you are all about. So if we open up an existing file, there are two more files here. There's the number four, which is the shop. Um, phone speaker nested setup file and then there's one that I've set up that uses double-sided nesting and also the um, the ability to be able to use a tool path template for it now I'm not going to get into that too much here but the file is set up for that and also in your file folder for this project there will be the actual front and back tool path template saved out for you so if you do want to experiment with that then it might be a good exercise for you. And there's a great support video that you can watch about um, toolpath templates uh, and so on to help you and maybe help you better understand how I set that file up. And I might just breeze over that in a second. So let's open up this file. So what I did was I just did the same thing before, went to my job setup, and I took that same job that I had with all the toolpaths already created, and then I just made it bigger to a sheet of material that is the same thickness but is just larger everywhere else and all the other settings are exactly the same so that's great and now we have this double-sided nesting idea so if we click the nesting button here the nesting tool you'll see that we can nest parts um, but because this is a two-sided job we now have the option for the two-sided nesting so if I go ahead and select all of these vectors then the software will automatically 
do its best to look at the front and the back of the job and, and decide what vectors on the back side are included in your front side artwork. So in this case, it worked out really well. We've got the, uh, the pockets in the back for the nut holes or the nut pockets. Um, and then we also have the, um, uh, it, it's figured out that it knows where that, that actually it's funny that it knows the, um, the vector that I use for my form tool. So it knows all that stuff and everything works out really well. If I go to the back side, you can see that it's got everything it needs. If I go to the back side and select it, it should just do the opposite for me. That's great. Perfect. So let's go back to the front, reselect all that. Now with the nesting, what I can do is I can set up how many I'd like to have. Um, the dimensions between each thing. So in this case, is a quarter inch is my tool diameter. I want a bit of clearance. I need a border gap. It's around the outside of my material. Uh, I'm going to let it rotate my parts by 90 degrees if it needs to. Uh, sometimes you might not want that depending on the grain of your wood, but in this case, I wasn't too concerned about that. Um, we don't need to allow parts inside of others. We don't need to, and we want to do the two-sided nesting. And we don't want to mirror anything for sure. Nothing should be mirrored. Um, and we did 10 copies. So if I click apply, you'll see that when I click preview, it will nest those up for me. And we can just say, okay, and we can keep that. The thing to remember is that it didn't nest the tooling. It only just nested our, um, our vectors. So if we go ahead and take a look at our tool paths again, and we want to go ahead and preview those, if we turn one on, then you'll see that they're not nested either. So with this particular case, because we did it by hand, you would need to actually go in and select all of the vectors that you needed to do um, and then recalculate your tool path. So if we wanted to do all of the um, the pockets for our, the V carving pockets for these, um, for our chamfer, we'd have to open up the tool path, select the vectors now, all of them, and then we could recalculate that tool path and off you go. So you could manually do this if you'd like to, but of course the best way to do this, if you knew you were gonna do this, is to set up a toolpath template um, to apply to all the layers so that you don't need to bother to do this every time. But um, this this works just fine. You just need to be patient and recalculate those toolpaths and you'll see what it does and that's perfect. So this particular setup would be good if you were gonna do maybe not 10, but let's say you were just gonna do two or three um, on one piece of material and then that would be great. Okay, so that's just kind of a nice feature in case you do want to make them for Christmas or for holidays or for birthday gifts or for grandkids or whatever you'd like to do. So that's how you can help to use or how double-sided nesting can help you to collect both your front and back vectors and uh, nest them quite nicely for you. You just need to remember to reset up your tooling again with those new vectors that you've just created. Okay, so let's have a look at the double-sided nesting with the option of using the toolpath template. Okay, so let's just go ahead and open up an existing file. We're going to reopen up shop um, the number four file here. The number five file is the result that we're going to see of the number four file. So that, that's just if you want to take a look at the end result if you're interested. So we'll open this up. Now what I've done is I've actually gone and added a whole pile of layers here. And this is the setup for the actual um, toolpath template. So what I needed to do was I needed to take the levels that I had that I used to design it with and break them up, break up those vectors onto, the, onto different layers named for the tool that I was going to use to cut them or maybe not the tool so much as maybe the, the toolpath strategy I was going to use and the tool that I was going to use. So if we turn all these off, and we'll start with the top. So I've got, this, this is the vectors that I'm going to use always for the V-bit plus the clearance toolpath, okay? And that's why I have those on a layer called V-bit and clearance. So I just, I created the level and I copied those vectors to that level. And then here's my V-bit profile. This is the profile that goes around the face of the actual front. And then we have the, the quarter inch deep pocket and the vectors for the 0.79 inch deep pocket, the half inch deep pocket and so on along. So if we turn these all on, you'll see that these all have 
vectors on them and they're all specific to the tool or the strategy that I'm using for them and you'll see that that's what it looks like if we look at the back side I did the same on the back side so that's great okay so there we have it and you'll see that all of those are this pocket face back so I've named them all appropriately but yet when you look at the tool paths these are all the same that I had when I was just cutting them um, on their own so now what I've done though is in the actual tool path at the very bottom I've used this automatic vector selector option so if I click that now this is for the um, the v-bit and the clearance so what I've told it to do is to select all of the closed vectors that are on the v-bit plus clearance level right here and I want to associate this with the tool path okay and I close that down and then when I calculate that it'll actually just calculate that one little bit which is totally fair okay so now what I what I can do is if I close this down and once I've associated all of those tool paths the so same with the the profile chamfer if I look at that this tool path based on this vector using the vector selector is selecting all the closed vectors on the vbit plus profile um, or the vbit profile uh, level or layer excuse me and it's going to go ahead and associate that tool path with anything that's on that level that or that layer again that um, follows or falls into that criteria okay so we close that down okay now that I have that all set up I can go ahead now and go and do the double-sided nesting thing so if I go to my uh, drawing tab and I select my nesting and I choose all of those you'll see I got them all um, we're gonna rotate our parts that's fine we're gonna allow a two-sided parts that's great well, that looks good we are going to make 10 copies okay we'll apply that and then we'll preview that and you'll see that now we have all those things done and now if i just click ok and i recalculate my tool paths you'll see that's automatically recalculating all those tool paths based on the tool paths and the tool path template so so again so if i these are this is just telling me this warning is just telling me that some of the tool paths will cut through and i know that already the bolt holes will cut through the the center part of the middle sound chamber will cut through and so on so it's just telling me it's going to do that and that's great so if we take a look at this let's just take a look at the pocket the deep pocket so all of the vectors that are on this particular layer which is the pockets 0.5 deep and that are closed vectors they're going to go ahead and use this tool path this tool data and calculate new tool paths for that anything that's on there so that works really well if you're into associating now most people would use this for um, doing something like cabinetry work and so on um, and, and it's maybe not super practical for what this is all about but let's just say you had three or four different styles of this speaker maybe we had one with the v carve logo on the front we had one with the aspire logo one with the cut 2d logo and we wanted to use those but we wanted to not bother have to set up all the tooling every time just bring in some new vectors and put them on that layer in the right spot then there you have it that would be a great reason for your doing this or maybe if you were going to change the bow or the sound chamber on the inside then you could go ahead and use this sort of setup but you're going to use the same tool just different shapes then this would be a great use for this particular option if you would like to have some more information on how to associate your tool paths with layers then definitely have a look at the uh, tool path template support files that you can find at vectric.com but that this would just be a nice little taster for you to have a look at it and that's pretty much it for now i'm happy with both of these speakers um if i had a, i could have just gone ahead and, and taken my original dynam design and made a few changes to it but i'm glad i did take it to the next level and really come up with a really nice looking finished product if you go ahead and cut this we would love to see it if you go ahead and take this and modify it and make it your own we'd even really like to see it even more so so post it socially make sure you tag us in it if you have any questions or comments please get a hold of us we'd be happy to hear from you and hopefully we can help you with any of your questions anyway that's it for now thank you very much and be safe well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I hope that 
that you guys took something from that. I know I enjoyed it a lot making that and I really enjoyed having the finished piece in my hands. Um, I have to say that the prototype didn't quite go like I said as planned, but in the end, um, it was a great learning experience that took me to creating this in the end, which I'm very proud of. And uh, I hope that you guys will take the free plans that you can now download from your VNCO account. And I'll make sure that I post um, a link to that in the chat next door. And if not, it's in the description below as well. And um, also, um, if you have if you have a VNCO account, go in, log in there, and you can download it from there. Um, if you did miss part of this video, then this will be here and available for you to uh, to watch. And we're going to do the same thing next week again. Rebecca will be back. Rebecca will be back then to show you one of her projects. Well, anyway, I hope you guys are all keeping safe. You're still making, having lots of fun. And most importantly, you're all staying very, very healthy out there. And from all of us at Vectric, thanks again for popping by and watching our live event. Okay, until next time, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.